Welcome to Sunday Sermon. This week we're covering creation. What's the point? And so we turn to Genesis 1. We read it on Monday in our Monday Musings. And so today we're going to kind of unpack it a little bit and expound upon it. And we live in a day where science rules, don't we? Follow the science, they say. Right? If you've learned anything from high school or college, it's that this world is several billion years old, right? So how do we as Christians understand the Bible alongside of these scientific claims? That's the question. How do we as Christians understand the Bible in the light of these scientific claims? Do we just shun the Bible or do we just shun the science? Which is it? Make a choice. So before we go any further, why don't we pray? Father God, nourish our hearts, nourish our minds, guide us, give us your truth, give us your understanding, and give us your grace as we try to make heads and tails of everything. Lord, we ask all of this in your name. Amen. So something to know before we even dive into Genesis is that the Bible is not the only ancient creation account. There are multiple. We have some from Sumeria. We have some from uh, the Hittites. We have some from Egypt. These are all from the ancient Near East, and I haven't even listed all of them. If you look at the creation accounts, they're not concerned with how we got here. In other words, they're, they're not concerned with all the inner workings of the science as to how we got here. They're not chron chrono chronological accounts. No. They are more concerned with why we are here. They're concerned with our purpose, our meaning, how exactly we got here. It's not precise. Now, we have to keep in mind that Genesis is very much a, a, a part of Israel. Israel being a part of the ancient Near East. It is literally sandwiched between Egypt and Mesopotamia. It's part of the ancient Near East. So whatever the broader culture of the ancient Near East seems to be concerned with suggests that that is what Genesis 2 is concerned with. It's not concerned with chronological accounts. It's concerned with purpose. Why are we here? So keep that in the background of your mind as we go through Genesis. Now, we've already read Genesis. I'm not going to read it again. If you want to read it, you can read it yourself. You can go watch the reading from Monday Musings. I'll put the link down in the blog below. And I would encourage you to read it. But you'll notice that the creation account, it's seven days, but we're going to focus on the first six days. The seventh day, God rested beautiful. He culminates in rest. But that's not why he created. You'll notice there is a parallelism between day one, two, and three and days four, five, and six. So that day one cor corresponds to day four. Day two corresponds to day five. Day three corresponds to day six. Look, Day one, God creates light. <laughs> Day four, God creates the sun, the moon, and the stars to create light, both during the day and the night. On day two, God creates the sky, separating it from the waters down below. On day five, God fills the sky with birds, and fills the water down below with sea creatures. On day three, God creates land and calls the water the seas. Well, on day six, God fills the land with land animals and humans. The last thing God creates is humans. 
And not only does God create humans, he creates humans in God's own image. Did he create the sun, the moon, and the stars in his own image? Did he create birds and sea creatures in his own image? Did he create land animals in his own image? No, but he did humans or humankind. Some translations just say man. It should be understood. Humankind, humans, male and female, not just man. And he blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply. And he gives them a command, rule over the earth, subdue it. To subdue in Hebrew is kibshu, kibshu. I remember it because the three root letters are ka, bet, chin, kabash. You put the kabash on it. You are subjugating. You're pressing. You're subduing. It's even used in other contexts. Force into slavery. And in negative contexts, it's even to violate a woman. Not necessarily the best term in other contexts, but clearly in this usage here, humans are to rule over the earth and everything in it. Humans are therefore appointed by God. No other part of creation is appointed by God, but humans are, and humans are created in his image. There's something special about humans, isn't there? And that's the point. Genesis is saying there's something special about humans. What's so special? Humans are uniquely created in God's image. Why are we here? God deemed it so. Why are we here? God has us here to take care of and to rule over his creation. The psalmist David, King David, in Psalm 8, puts it very beautifully here. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. Verse 3, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place. That's day four. It covers day five in verse eight. Skip ahead. You have made them the birds in the sky and the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. And then back up to verse seven for day six. You made them all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild. But then earlier before that, humans in verse five. You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. So he starts with day four, but then he works backwards, day six and day five. But all the elements of days four, five, and six are present here. Clearly, David is thinking about creation. And it culminates in verse four with this question. What is man or what is mankind? that you are mindful of them, human beings, that you would care for them. That's the golden question. Why are we here? Why are we here? We're here because God wants us to be here. God created us. Why are we here? Because God has placed us as his appointed servant to watch over and rule his creation, his good creation. That's why we're here. I'll say it again. Verses five and six. You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. We're made in God's image. We're special. Lower than the angels or lower than God because it's Elohim, depending on the translation. But specifically, you made them rulers. Kibshu. 
to rule, to subjugate, rulers over the works of your hands, and you put everything under their feet. Think of the honor that is. Now, what's interesting is there's this verse earlier in Psalm 8, through the praise of children and infants, you have established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. No matter how you interpret what this is saying, notice that it is out of weakness, out of the weak, God demonstrates his strength. Hmm. There's nothing more weak than a baby, right? Nothing more weak. And yet it is from the praise of the weak that God establishes a stronghold against his enemies. In other words, in our weakness, he is strong. He can take heart weaknesses and turn them into strengths. Now, why do I bring this up? You cannot understand creation. You cannot understand specifically Genesis 1's account of creation without keeping in mind the literary structure. It's a beautiful parallelism designed to highlight God's greatest creation, humans. It's designed to culminate in his creation of humans. But that does not mean humans are the strongest. That does not mean they are the biggest. So in Job, after Job goes through all of his suffering, eventually he confronts God. It takes a long time to get to that point. But eventually he does. And God puts him in his place right quick. Look at Job 38. Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Uh-oh, Job. You spoke too soon, brother. You spoke way too soon. Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you will answer me. This is important. Verse 4. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you understand. The fact of the matter is this. We have creation's account in Genesis 1, but we were not there. We were not there. A true biblical account of creation must Consider that fact. We were not there. We don't know how God created the world. We don't know. How can you have light without the sun? Hmm? Day one, light. How can you have light without the sun, which was not created till day four? In fact, when was vegetation created? On day three, the land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. How can you have vegetation without light? They need the sun, do they not? Now, you can argue, well, God made light and was sustaining it himself on day one. Sure. But do you see, now we're trying to stretch things here? It's okay. It's okay. Scientists can make whatever claims they want. It's okay. Maybe this earth is billions of years old. It's okay. I would argue from a biblical account, it doesn't matter. Not one bit. We were not there when God created light. We were not there when God separated the sky from the waters. We were not there. 
when he separated the land and the seas. We were not there when he created the sun, moon, and stars. We were not there when, we, when he created birds and sea creatures. We were not there when he created land creatures. We were not there when he created humans. We weren't there. But I digress. Let's continue in Job. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set, or who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang together, and all the angels shouted for joy. Where were you, Job? Who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb, when I made the clouds its garment and wrapped it in thick darkness? That's day two, is it not? When I fixed limits for it and set its doors and bars in place, when I said, this far you may come, and no farther. Here's where your proud waves halt. This is day two of creation. Have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place, that it might take the earth by the edges and shake the wicked out of it? This is a mixture of day one and day four and maybe even day three because there's land, it would seem, on a horizon. The earth takes shape like clay under a seal. It features st stand out like those of a garment. The wicked are denied their light and their upraised arm is broken. Now we've got a mixture of like, I don't know, day three and day six, but like not creation of humans. Mentions the wicked. Have you journeyed to the springs of the sea or walked in the recess, recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been shown to you? Have you seen the gates of the deepest darkness? Have you comprehended the vast expanses of the earth? Tell me if you know all this. So again, we see like this combination of days one, two, three, and four, maybe day six. Have you entered the storehouses of the snow or seen the storehouses of the hail, which I reserve for times of trouble, for days of war and battle? What is the way to the place where the lightning is dispersed or the place where the east winds are scattered over the earth? Who cuts a channel for the torrents of rain and a path for the thunderstorm? To water a land where no one lives, an uninhabited desert, to satisfy a desolate wasteland and make it sprout with grass. Does the rain have a father? Who fathers the drops of dew? From whose womb comes the ice? Who gives birth to the frost from the heavens? when the waters become hard as stone, when the surface of the deep is frozen. This is, this is just teeming with sky and water language, right? Can you bind the chains of the Pleiades? Can you loosen Orion's belt? Now we're talking day four and the stars. Can you bring forth the constellations in their seasons or lead out the bear with its cubs? These are all constellations. Do you know the laws of the heavens? Can you set up God's dominion over the earth? Can you raise your voice to the clouds and cover yourself with a flood of water? Now we're back to sky and waters. Do you send the lightning bolts on their way? Do, you, do they report to you? Here we are. Who gives the ibis wisdom? I don't, what is an ibis? I don't know. No, oh, it's a bird. An ibis is a bird. I did not know that. I had, had to look it up. Or gives the rooster understanding. So we've got two birds here, wisdom and understanding, ibis and rooster. Who has the wisdom to count the clouds? Who can tip over the water jars of the heavens when the dust becomes hard and the clods of earth stick together? So we've got a mixture of day two, day three, day five. Do you hunt the prey for the lionesses? Now we're on day six and satisfy the hunger of the lions when they crouch in their dens or lie in wait in a thicket. Who provides food for the raven when its young cry out to God and wander about for lack of food? That's a mixture of day five and day six. And it continues into chapter 39, covering mountain goats and ox and donkeys. Now we're clearly in day six and day five with the ostrich and the horse and the hawk. So that was round one. Job is found wanting. He can do none of those things. And then God rings the bell for round two. And Job says, I cannot reply. I will say no more. And the Lord doesn't let it go. No, 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 no. We're not done here. And here's the refrain again. Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you will answer me. Would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? Do you have an arm like God's? And can your voice thunder like his? And you fast forward to verse 15 of, of chapter 40. 
Look at Behemoth, which I made along with you. Day six, land animals and humans, which I made along with you. It feeds on grass like an ox, but it has great strength and power in the muscles. Its tail sways like cedar. Sinews of its thighs are close-knit. Its bones are tubes of bronze. Its limbs are like rods of iron. It ranks first among the works of God. Yet its maker can approach it with his sword. It is the greatest. It is the biggest. It is the strongest. You cannot approach it, Job, but God can. Verse 24, can anyone capture it by the eyes or trap it and pierce its nose? No. Then chapter 41, can you pull in Leviathan with a fish hook or tie down its tongue with a rope? Can you put a cord through its nose or pierce its jaw with a hook? If you lay a hand on it, you will remember the struggle and never do it again. Any hope of subduing it is false. The mere sight of it is overpowering. Nothing on earth is its equal, a creature without fear. What's the point? Humans are not God's biggest, baddest creation. Indeed, humans are frail. Humans are weak. To be created in God's image does not mean we are God. Image is tselem. In effect, it's the same word for an idol, an image, uh, a representation, likeness, form, replica. And in this context, it means viceroy, witness. But in the end, God alone is God. And we are not. We are weak, but he is strong. Humans are the culmination of creation. The purpose is that God wants us here and he has given us meaning to subdue the earth and all that's in it. I hope that gives you a sense of purpose. I hope that gives you a sense of meaning. Work the ground. If you want to do a garden, do a, do a garden. Take care of your landscape. Pick up trash. Recycle. Make conscious decisions good conscious decisions. Take care of animals. If you see an animal uh, in distress, help it out. Contribute to good causes. That's another option. But remember, creation was very good. That includes you. Father God, thank you for creating us. Thank you for bringing this world into existence. No matter how it is exactly you did it, we know you alone are God, and you have done great things, things that we just cannot fathom. And Lord, thank you for uh, being with us and helping us to rule over your creation and entrusting us with your creation. Lord, help us to tend to it faithfully. We ask this, Lord, in your name. Amen. Well, if you enjoyed this sermon, please hit the like button. I appreciate it. And if you haven't done so already, follow me on WordPress. And last, comment down below. Did you find this sermon helpful? Did you know that there were other creation accounts from the ancient Near East? Was that illuminating for you? Did you know there was this parallelism between days one through three and four through six? Have you made the connection with Psalm 8 or even with Job? Let me know what you found helpful from this sermon. I would appreciate it. We'll see you tomorrow for our next Monday musing, setting the stage for the next week and next week's Sunday sermon. Take care.